Good morning, everyone. This meeting is called to order. Mr. Trobman, has anyone signed up for public comment? Good morning, Commissioners. Last Trobman General Counsel. We have one individual who would like to address the commission this morning. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone, Commissioner, Chairman. Uh, I'm Rasheen Muhammad. I'm the founder of EDS uh, here in Houston. It's a veteran organization that was established in 2016. Um, I'm here today uh, to just request uh, consideration for a rule or regulation change to a two-mile restriction put on our licenses for us to be able to do some of the things we do in our industry, which is the telecom industry. I'd like to make a recommendation that we kind of go to a mobile license, which allows us to not have to pay a licensing fee each two miles uh, that a school is registered. And I'd like to have consideration for a fee waiver, given um, that our school was impacted by Hurricane Harvey, uh, COVID, uh, the freeze, and it has been just a uh, tremendous uh, up here battle uh, to get our school recognized and stay in compliance and uh, have any information that you need commissioner or chairman would like to see regarding why I'm making this recommendation or consideration uh, to be considered uh, by the gentleman on the, uh, the sit forth for me today. Thank you, sir. Okay. Chairman, commissioners, that's that's all we have this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Trollman. Good morning, Ms. Gonzalez. Good morning. Oh, see, no cases to reconsider under agenda item three. That is correct. On tax liability cases under agenda item four, we have one tax case on docket 39. That is correct. It is case number TD 2201806. Commissioner Emerson. I agree with staff recommendation. Mr. Alvarez. I agree with staff's recommendation. Mr. Chairman. I agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. We have no fair housing cases under agenda item five. That's under correct. agenda item six, we have no wage claim cases on docket 39 pulled for additional discussion. That is correct. There are no wage claim cases pulled for additional discussion, but you should have already received the short form dissent list for the remaining cases to be voted on docket 39 for the wage claims. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining wage claim cases on docket 39. I second the motion except for those cases in which I'm dissenting as reflected on the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 39. I concur. Chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting is reflected in the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 39. Motion passes with the exceptions noted. Let's move to agenda item seven in consideration of unemployment insurance cases on docket 39. Please proceed when you're ready. We are ready. Case number 2867814, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. First, I agree that because the employer witnesses were not available to testify due to a holiday, the employer, the employer established a good cause for its non appearance. Concerning the job separation, the AT2 decision is fully supportable. The claimant had been warned several times regarding her performance, including having received a final warning. Despite this, the claimant admitted that she made an error during the final incident and did not follow the instructions for her assignment. The claimant's failure to carry out her duties as assigned after a final warning constituted misconduct connected with the work. We should modify the AT decision. The employer had good cause for its non-appearance. Misconduct, reimbursing employer, not billed, sever the adequate response issue. Regarding the good cause, the employer failed to participate in the hearing because they elected to observe a prior holiday on a date of the hearing. This is not good cause. Reverse the no good cause, no misconduct bill reimburse an employer. Even if the employer did have good cause, the claimant should have still be entitled to benefits. The claimant was discharged because her new supervisor did not like her work. The claimant's inability to perform in her new manager standards is not misconduct. Modify good cause, no misconduct bill reimburse an employer. Modify the AT, employer established good cause for AT1, no misconduct, bill reimbursed an employer, void adequate response. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent. Thank you. Case number 292. <laughs> Thank 
Commissioner Alvarez, do you have a vote on the adequate response issue? Yes. Void the AR. Thank you, sir. We have to short form to send. Yes. Mm -hmm. Case number 2929726, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. Uh, first, I agree that the employer did not have good cause for its non appearance. As to the chargeback issue, even without good cause, the employer's appeal, which was available to the AT1, established that the qu claimant quit. In the absence of any evidence that the claimant had good cause for quitting, the employer's account should, be, should not be charged. We should modify the AT decision. The employer did not have good cause for its non appearance, no chargeback. The decision is correct. The employer's petition to reopen stated they missed their hearing by a few minutes. At the second hearing, the owner testified he didn't know why the petition stated that and only provided that the employers sometimes are busy. In their appeal to the commission, the employer stated they were unaware of the hearing. The employer's statements to the commission are inconsistent and failed to provide a reason for their non-appearance. Affirm the AT, no good cause, chargeback. Modify the AT, employer did not establish good cause for AT1, no chargeback. Short form dissent. I have your short form sent, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 2963609, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is correct. Correction is not correct. This case involves the claimant's initial claim dated August 30th, 2020. The claimant's benefit year ended on August 28, 2021. Despite the employer's timely appeal to the separation determination dated September 17, 2020, the hearing was not scheduled until over a year later on October 12, 2021 six weeks after the claimant's benefit year ended. The claimant did not receive the hearing notice before the hearing, hearing because when the hearing notice was sent, the claimant was out of town for a family emergency. The claimant was not expecting a hearing notice since she was no longer filing claims. Her benefit year ended and she was unaware of the employer's appeal. She would have appeared had she received the notice. The claimant's clear and consistent testimony that she did not receive the hearing packet prior to the hearing established that the claimant had good cause for missing the hearing. We should resubmit this case for summary of the merits. Uh, the appeal tribunal decision should be modified. Regarding good cause, the claimant was away from her home for over a month, yet made no arrangements to have her mail collected in her absence. As such, the claimant was not home when the AT packet arrived at her address. Since arranging to have her mail collected was a circumstance that was within the claimant's power to control, she did not establish a good cause for her non-appearance. As to the job separation, the record supports a finding that the claimant failed to meet, <clears throat> to meet the employer's job expectations in a manner that constituted work-connected misconduct. Namely, the claimant failed to make improvements in her work after adequate training. We should therefore modify the AT decision. The claimant did not have good cause for, for her non-appearance misconduct, no charge back, several adequate employer response. Modify the AT, claimant did not establish good cause for AT1, no misconduct, charge back, void adequate response. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent. Excuse me, one moment. I just wanna confirm that we have a majority vote. Um, Mr. Chairman, you granted benefits to the claimant? That is correct. And Commissioner Demerson, you would deny benefits to the claimant? Yeah, that's right. Uh, misconduct, no chargeback. Thank you. Don't Ms. have Miller, thank you for the clarification. I'll agree with Chairman Daniel. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'll short form this in. Yes, sir. Case number 3005864, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision should be reversed. The claimant was discharged for allegedly leaving work early without permission on December 20th, 2020. The claimant testified that the employer did not have the correct PPE, PPE for the claimant to work in a COVID wing of the facility as she was scheduled to do. She also provided that her supervisor gave her permission to leave since the employer did not have the proper equipment and there was no more work for her in the other parts of the facility. The supervisor did not testify in the hearing. The claimant's uncontradicted firsthand testimony establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that she had permission to leave work when she did. 
While the employer's witness also claimed that the claimant did not show for work or call in on two subsequent days, the claimant credibly testified that she was scheduled off those days. The employer did not cite any no calls, no shows on those particular days in their prior statements to the commission or in a, the determination paperwork, leaving the, this allegation less than credible. The claimant was discharged for reasons that did not constitute misconduct connected with the work. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, charge back, void, adequate response. Uh, the appeal tribunal decision should be modified. The claimant quit after allegedly being denied appropriate PPE for her job duties. However, the employer provided credible testimony that it provided the PPE required for the job. Nonetheless, the claimant wanted additional PPE beyond what was required and thereafter left the premises. The claimant did not appear for her subsequent shifts. Accordingly, the claimant resigned due to her dissatisfaction with the employer's PPE while work was still available, which constituted a voluntary quit without work connected good cause. We should therefore modify the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back, several adequate employer response. Modify the AT, voluntary leaving, no charge back, several adequate response. Ms. Gonzalez, short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Commissioner Alvarez. Case number 3044176, Commissioner Alvarez. The appeal tribunal decision should be modified. I agree that the employer established good cause for missing the first hearing regarding the separation. The decision should be reversed. The claimant's coworker instigated the final incident by calling the claimant by a nickname the claimant had repeatedly told a coworker not to use. When the claimant again told the coworker not to use the nickname, the coworker jumped up, got in the claimant's face, and used inappropriate language towards the claimant. The claimant did not get in the coworker's face or physically intimidate the coworker. While the claimant may have yelled at a coworker while the coworker walked away, this act alone does not rise to the level of misconduct connected with the work, since the instigating coworker was not fired for his behavior. The claimant's credible firsthand testimony regarding the incident should be given more weight than the employer's secondhand testimony. The employer had multiple opportunities to provide credible firsthand evidence, but failed to do so. As such, the employer has presented insufficient evidence to prove that the claimant was discharged for misconduct connected with the work. Modify the AT, the employer had good cause for missing the first hearing, no misconduct. Uh, we should <clears throat> affirm the AT decision. First, I agree that the employer had good cause for its non-appearance because the employer's primary representative was unable to participate in the hearing due to an unforeseen medical emergency. Concerning the job separation, the claimant received various verbal warnings for aggression and was advised that his job was in jeopardy. The claimant was terminated when he thereafter aggressively confronted a coworker over an innocuous uh, statement. The claimant admitted to confronting the coworker and acknowledged that he did not consult upper management about his concerns. Since the claimant was previously warned about his behavior, but thereafter continued to act in an aggressive fashion at the workplace, the claimant's conduct constituted mismanagement of his position of employment and was misconduct connected with the work. Hence, we should affirm the AT decision. The employer established good cause for missing the AT1 misconduct. Affirm the AT, employer established good cause for AT1 misconduct. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Commissioner Alvarez. Thank you. Case number 3047752, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision is not supportable. The claimant was held eligible for PUA beginning June 7, 2020, because she left her job to care for her minor children who were at home due to school closures. The claimant was held ineligible for PUA beginning November 22, 2020, because her children returned to school. However, even though her children may have returned to school, the claimant could not return to work because she no longer had a job to return to. Her continued unemployment was still caused by the pandemic, and she should be she should continue to be considered eligible. Reverse EAT PUA eligible beginning June 7, 2020. Uh, the AT decision is not supportable. Both the claimant's work arrangements and her children's school and after school care issues were directly affected by the pandemic. The combination of those factors caused the loss of her job. Her circumstances were thus covered by the PUA program in the CARES Act. Accordingly, we should reverse the AT decision. The claimant is eligible for PUA benefits beginning November 22nd, 2020. 
affirm the AT PUA not eligible beginning November 22nd, 2020. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Commissioner Alvarez. Thank you. Correction, hold on, Ms. Gonzalez. Um, just to clarify, um, Commissioner Alvarez, you wanted the claimant to be eligible beginning June 7th, 2020, is that correct? Yes, can we clarify the vote again? Um, Commissioner DeMarson? Yeah, my, my vote is uh, the claimant is eligible for EUA benefits beginning November 22nd, 2020. We'll, we'll agree with Commissioner Alvarez on June 7th, I believe, 2020. Right, June, the June date of 2020. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So my vote is actually, um, the claimant is eligible for PUA benefits beginning November 22nd, 2020. As I understand it, Commission Alvarez is voting in the same fashion, but with a different date of June, 2020. And so I'll agree with Commission Alvarez's okay. June the 2020 date. And Mr. Chairman? Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Case number 3081437, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision on the good cause should be reversed because the claimant never received the notice of telephone hearing. And this case should be resubmitted on the merits. Reverse the AT, claimant had good cause for the non-appearance at AT1, resubmit. Even if the claimant did not have good cause for her non-appearance, the available record establishes that the claimant had good cause connected with the work to quit the job. As established in the AT1 hearing and the prior documents, the claimant previously had complained about safety issues with residents at the facility. There is no evidence of any res response from the employer to her complaints. On the final incident, the claimant was then severely beaten by a patient causing her seriously injuries, serious injuries. The claimant provided credible statements to the commission that coworkers and supervisors did nothing to intervene when she was beaten, and the employer's testimony did not contradict this account. The preponderance of the evidence establishes that the claimant quit the job due to substantial threats to her personal safety despite prior complaints about the issue. She had good cause connected with the work to quit. No good cause for the non-appearance at AT1, no voluntary leaving, chargeback, void adequate response. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. <clears throat> Concerning good cause, the claimant did not receive the hearing packet because she did not update the commission with her correct and complete address. Since the claimant bore the responsibility to accurately update the commission of an address change, and because the claimant did not provide credible and persuasive evidence that she was prevented from participating in the AT1 hearing <clears throat> due to circumstances beyond her control, the claimant did not establish good cause for missing the AT1 hearing. Concerning the job separation, the claimant received training on dealing with aggressive patients and was aware of the safety hazards associated with the job. Although the claimant was involved in an incident with the patient, the evidence shows that the claimant did not address her concerns with the employer prior to her resignation. As such, since the claimant quit without providing the employer with a reasonable opportunity to remedy her concerns, the claimant's separation constituted a voluntary quit without work connected good cause. Hence, we should modify the AT decision. The claimant did not have good cause for missing the AT1 hearing, voluntary leaving, no charge back, sever the adequate response uh, and for our response. Modify the AT, claimant did not establish good cause for AT1, no voluntary leaving, charge back, void adequate response. Could you repeat Short form dissent. Uh, short form dissent. I'm sorry, could you repeat your vote, Mr. Chairman? Modify the AT, claimant did not establish good cause for AT1, no voluntary leaving, charge back, void adequate response. Thank you. Case number 3083539. One, one moment, please. Just want to clarify. Yeah. We actually have a majority, but it's split across different commissioners. So we have a majority of no good cause, uh, with Commissioner Demerson and Mr. Chairman Daniel, and then a majority of um, granting the unemployment benefits and voiding the AR ruling uh, with Chairman Daniel and Commissioner Alvarez. And did you have a short form to say, sir? I did. Thank you. My apologies. Please proceed. Case number 3083539, Commissioner Alvarez. 
the decision is not supportable. The claimant was unable to attend the hearing because she was picking up her children up after school. There was no other individual who could pick up the children up from school. The claimant has good cause for missing the hearing. Reverse EAT, good cause, and resubmit. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. Concerning good cause, the claimant missed the AT1 hearing because she did not make arrangements to pick up her children from school. This, the evidence shows that the claimant did not contact the hearing officer prior to her hearing, nor make plans to attend the scheduled hearing. As such, the claimant did not establish a good cause for missing the AT1 hearing. Concerning the job separation, the claimant quit when she refused to accept a new client offered by the employer. The new work offered to the claimant was at a reasonable distance with better wages and conditions of employment. As such, by refusing the new assignment, the claimant quit without good cause connected with the work. Hence, we should modify the AT decision. The claimant did not have good cause for missing the AT1 hearing, voluntary leaving, no charge back, sever the adequate employer response issue. Reverse AT, claimant established good cause for AT1, resubmit. We will resubmit the case. Case number 3136954, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was discharged for alleged poor performance and attendance violations. The last attendance incidents occurred over two months prior to her discharge, and the employer has failed to provide specifics or dates regarding her alleged poor performance. The employer alleged they provided the claimant with several warnings, but none were provided to the commission. The employer has failed to provide sufficient evidence to establish misconduct connected with the work. The employer named an account should be corrected. Reverse the AT, correct employer name, no misconduct, chargeback. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. <clears throat> First, I agree that the employer's name and account number should be corrected. Regarding the job separation, the claimant was warned after deficiencies and errors with her work. Because the, claimant, because the client company continued to report complaints about the claimant's failure to carry out her assigned duties, the claimant was discharged for misconduct connected with work. We should therefore modify the AT decision, misconduct at no chargeback ruling and correct the employer's name and account number. Modify the AT, correct the employer name and account, no misconduct chargeback. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Commissioner Dillerson. Thank you. Case number 3144447, Commissioner Alvarez. While I do not dispute that the claimant filed a late appeal to the determinations dated December 15, 2020, the reporting determination involved an open period in eligibility. As such, the commission can assume jurisdiction over the reporting issue to close the ineligibility as early as January 30th, 2021. The claimant denied seeing the message that she needed to report after filing claim certifications on December 7, 2020. Before filing her late appeal on February 11, 2021, the claimant had been calling the commission to find out why she was not receiving benefits. The claimant spent hours on hold. When she spoke to a TWC representative, she was not given the correct information. Eventually, she was advised to file her appeal, but she was never informed of the reporting ineligibility or the need to contact the telecenter until the hearing on June 6, 2022, well over a year after she filed her appeal and well after the benefit year for her PUA claim ended. We should assume jurisdiction over the reporting issue and close the open period reporting and eligibility, and eligibility effective January 30th, 2021. Modify the tribunal late appeal to the AT, filing not eligible from December 22nd, 2020 through December 5th, 2020. Reporting not, reporting not eligible from December 20th, 2020 through January 30th, 2021. Void ineligibility and closure dated June 9, 2022. The AT decision is supportable. The claimant filed a late appeal from three different ineligi ineligibility rulings. Each determination clearly notified her of the need to file an appeal on time and how such an appeal could be submitted. No exception under Rule 815.32 would apply in this case. Concerning the ending date of the ineligibility for failing to report to TWC as instructed, the AT properly declined to close the ineligibility 14 days prior to her late appeal. Due to the fact that by the time of the hearing, almost a year and a half after the determination was made, 
the claimant had still not contacted TWC as instructed. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision. The claimant filed a late appeal. The prior decisions are left in effect. Modify the AT untimely claimant appeal reporting not eligible from December 20th, 2020 to January 30th, 2021. Filing not eligible from November 22nd, 2020 to December 5th, 2020. Void the June 9th determination. Mr. Alvarez, could you please repeat your date for me? Yes, they were actually the same, but let me go ahead and repeat it. So, modify the appeal, late appeal to the AT, finally not eligible from November 22nd, 2020 through December 5th, 2020, reporting not eligible from December 20th, 2020 through January 30th, 2021, void ineligibility closure date, June 9th, 2022. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm in a short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent. Thank you. Case number 3186437, three, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision should be reversed. The claimant was fired for his failure to, com to complete job duties in the manner in which he spoke to one of his uh, employer's, uh, employer's workers. The employer's uncontested testimony reflects that the claimant failed to comp complete various tasks for the employer. Moreover, the claimant used profanity when speaking to another, co another worker and questioned whether he should work more if he was not getting paid more. In addition, the employer asked the claimant why he was not working with his coworker for various orders. The claimant responded that he does not get involved with his coworker and that the claimant had no idea what his coworker is doing. While the claimant did not receive a final warning that his job was in, je was in jeopardy, not all final incidents require a final warning to establish work-connected misconduct. Here, it is not unreasonable to conclude that the claimant knew or should have known he would lose his job for what amounts to not uh, amounts to not perform his job duties. He should therefore reverse the AT decision, misconduct, no charge back, adequate and for response. The AT decision is supportable. The evidence showed that the claimant never met the employer's performance expectations. Moreover, the employer chose to decrease the claimant's rate of pay rather than dismiss him when his performance level became apparent, he was then discharged at the employer's convenience and for reasons other than misconduct connected with the work. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, chargeback. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, chargeback. Short form dissent. have your short form dissent, Mr. Emerson. Case number 3204960, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision is correct. The claimant provided credible and persuasive testimony that she did not receive the hearing packet prior to the hearing. The claimant filed an initial claim with the effective date of August 8, 2021. A determination dated September 8, 2021 approved the claimant for benefits and she stopped filing payments request after October 22, 2021. Since the claimant had no notice that the employer had filed a timely appeal to the determination and since she had stopped filing claims with the commission, she did not update her address when she moved in February of 2022. As such, she did not receive the hearing packet that was mailed on May 5th, 2022, which was eight months after the determination was issued. The claimant filed a timely petition to reopen and should not lose her ability to testify in her case simply because there was no lengthy delay, because there was a lengthy delay, lengthy delay in scheduling the employer's appeal for a hearing. Affirm the AT, claimant had good cause for the non-appearance, resubmit. Yeah, the, the appeal tribunal decision should be reversed. Regarding good cause, the claimant did not receive the uh, hearing packet for the AT1 because she failed to update her address for TWC, which is, which is the circumstance that is within the claimant's power to control. Accordingly, the claimant did not have good cause for a non-appearance. As to the job separation, the employer provided testimony that established that the claimant had been the subject of several complaints. In addition, the employer testified that the claimant had been warned that she needed to improve or she would be fired. Nonetheless, several days later, the employer stated that the claimant yelled at her subordinates, which resulted in two of them quitting. Because the claimant was warned that she could be fired if she did not improve and then proceeded to yell at her subordinates several days later, the claimant's actions constituted work-connected misconduct. As such, we should reverse the AT decision, 
the claimant did not have good cause for a non-appearance, misconduct, no charge back, adequate and thorough response. Affirm the AT, claimant established good cause for AT1 resubmit. We will resubmit the case. Case number 3210376, Commissioner Demerson. Commission should grant a rehearing in this case. A critical event in this case was the telephone call that was re reviewed by the employer and the claimant on March 11, 2020. Thereafter, the claimant became separated from employment. The claimant alleges that her supervisor yelled and demeaned her on the call. The employer alleges the claimant's supervisor instructed the claimant on how to do her work and that the claimant became hostile and began to yell at her supervisor. Since both parties make reference to this phone call, the commission should procure a copy of the same for review. This would assist the commission to gain an accurate assessment as to whether the exchange in question provided the claimant good work connected cause to quit. Accordingly, we should conduct a rehearing to obtain a copy of the telephone call in question. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant was subjected to continued poor treatment from her supervisor. She complained about this to, manage, to management, but nothing was done. On the final incident, the claimant recorded her supervisor yelling at her and speaking in a demeaning manner. She provided this to her employer, but again, no action was taken. The claimant asked to work under a different supervisor, but a request was denied. The claimant made a reasonable attempt to resolve her issues with her supervisor and had good cause connected with the work to resign in response to his behavior. A permanent AT, no voluntary leaving, chargeback. Re rehear. We will rehear the case. Case number 3213936, Commissioner Demerson. The commission should conduct a rehearing in this case. The employer's witness provided sworn testimony that the owner of the entity, a first-hand witness to the final incident, did not appear due to a death in, the, in, his, in his family. The employer in its appeal to the commission is offering the witness to provide relevant testimony about the claimant separation. As such, we should rehear this case to take testimony from the employer's witness about the final incident in which final incident which led to the claimant separation. The AT decision is correct. The claimant gave two weeks notice of resignation on July 30th, 2021, but the employer kept her on until 9 30 2021 to help train replacements the claimant worked for an additional 1.5 months at the employer's convenience per established commission precedent the claimant was involuntarily separated for reasons that did not constitute misconduct connected with the work affirm the at no misconduct charge back we hear we will rehear the case Case number 3220363, Commissioner Alvarez. We should find that there has been no work separation from the named employer and void the claimant's separation determination. The claimant used the name employer's marketplace platform to accept service requests from the public through its digital network. The claimant's acceptance of service requests through the digital marketplace and the services she performed for the public constituted self-employment. The claimant never performed services for the employer and there was no work separation from the employer. Set aside, an AT, set aside the AT decision, void separation determination, valid claim. Uh, we should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. Uh, first, I do not contest the validity of claim issue. Concerning the job separation, the claimant quit because the wear and tear on her vehicle impeded her ability to perform the essential functions of her job. Since the claimant was aware and accepted the employer's condition of employment, which required her to provide her own transportation, the claimant's failure to perform delivery services for the employer constituted a voluntary quit without work connected good cause. Hence, we should affirm the AT decision, valid initial claim, voluntary leaving. Void continued claim. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, Commissioner Demerson. Yes, and I'll just clarify that uh, there is a majority vote to void the uh, continued claim separation determination. 
So both the chairman and Commissioner Alvarez voted to void that part. So. Okay, um, that is the last of the poll cases for docket 39. You should have received the uh, short form dissent list for the remaining cases to be voted on docket 39. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining UI cases on docket 39. Let me let me ask this question. I'm not sure I did this, but uh, I want to make sure that you did receive the short form dissent. I, I think that that was yes, sir. So, yes, thank you, Chairman. I second the motion, except for those cases in which I'm dissenting, as reflected on UI short form dissent list for Docket 39. I concur with the Chairman's motion, except for the cases on which I'm dissenting, as reflected in the UI short form dissent list for Docket 39. Motion passes with the exceptions noted. We'll take a short break. Thank you. This is agenda item 10 resource utilization for target disaster relief efforts and public health emergencies. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. Cerna, Allison Wilson, for the record, Child Care and Early Learning Division. Either, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's on. Is that better? <laughs> A little bit. Allison Wilson, Child Care and Early Learning Division. This morning for your consideration is the ninth tranche of child care stimulus funding initiatives. First is funding to support the move to paying child care providers prospectively. This is a one-time cost, which is needed to modify the payment schedule for reimbursing child care programs. We currently pay providers based on enrollment, not attendance, and this will not change. We will just modify when the provider gets paid. This change was included in the Chapter 809 Child Care Final Rules that you adopted at the September 13th meeting, and we estimate this will cost $50 million. Second is an increase of $75 million to the Child Care Industry Expansion initiative. You initially approved $75 million for this with the majority of this funding to support new startup awards for new child care programs. We've seen a huge response from entities who are interested in applying, so we're requesting funding to increase the number of applications we can support. We are also requesting to extend the application deadline for employer partnership applications. These applications are the most complex and take longer to develop. So we'd like to extend their application deadline to November 30th, 2023. And we'd also like to extend the deadline for all programs to expend funds to no later than March 31st, 2024. In the third issue, we are recommending 2.5 million to support enhancements to the Texas Early Childhood Professional Development System or TechPEDS, as well as to the Engage platform. Included in this tech ped, included in this is a TechPeds usability study, which is based on feedback we've received about looking for opportunities to make the system more user friendly. We hope the results of the study can inform future mm -hmm. system enhancements. Fourth, our modifications to the amounts that we provide in the 2022 Child Care Relief Fund 
to account for updated information on child care deserts that TWC received from the state demographer and update Texas Rising Star certification status. You already approved up to $3.4 billion for the 2022 CCRF, and these changes will be funded using those existing amounts. We also recommend extending the time available for providers to expend their funds through November of 2023. And lastly, our fifth issue is requesting 500 million to provide childcare services providers with a fifth childcare relief fund payment. This additional one-time payment can help all CCS providers who are now required to become Texas Rising Star in improving their program's quality standards. And as we transition away from the temporary enhanced reimbursement rates, this fifth payment can also serve as a one-time buffer to help in the transition back to TWC's standard reimbursement rates. And that concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None here. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the plan and methodology for the distribution of the ninth tranche of CCDF COVID-19 federal funding initiatives as recommended by staff and described in the discussion paper. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Is there an executive director's report to the... There is. I have two quick items, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. First, I'd like to mention, I, I think he was here, but he stepped out, um, that Bob Gear uh, was awarded the 2022 Torch Professional of the Year Award by Central Texas Workforce Solutions, and he'll be honored uh, in October at their awards luncheon. Uh, Bob's done a great deal of work with that board and all the boards. Uh, in assisting our veterans, and it's nice that they recognized him uh, for that. So I wanted to make sure that the commissioner were aware of that. And then also, I just want to remind the commissioners and get it on the record uh, for the public that we will be ha having a commission meeting at our annual conference uh, on the uh, 29th of uh, uh, in November. That's a Tuesday at 1.30 uh, at the Hilton uh, Anatole in uh, Dallas. And we will have a um, we'll have docket as well as a few policy items. And that's all that I have. Thank you, sir. Is there any other order of business come before the commission? Chairman, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Desi and her team for last week's successful uh, apprenticeship conference, the sixth annual one. I wanted it to be um, I wanted uh, to publicly acknowledge her great work and and again the the folks that were there and, and some of the conversations that took place were very meaningful and educational to the public that attended. And I think the Rio Grande Valley was very grateful that we had a, a conference down in the area. I'd also like to thank Julia and her team for the great work that they did. And Julia, thank you for that and making sure that all the things were taken care of behind the scenes. So thank you. Let me uh, echo some of the comments that have been, been <clears throat> mentioned. Uh, I also want to congratulate Bob Gear as well. I think Bob does a tremendous job. I, I love the, the way that they, they handle our veterans and it. So I wanted to make sure that that was known. Also, uh, Margie Henson, I uh, want to congratulate her. The Governor's Women's Commission uh, are going to award certain women, outstanding women in Texas government on tomorrow. And so Dr. Heather Hall on our team, uh, and, and Margie's a part of her team. So that, that will be, um, she'll be recognized on tomorrow at that, that ceremony. And also wanted to, um, Say congratulations to Desi and her team and Commissioner Alvarez, the work that you've done in the apprenticeship space uh, to make that happen. We had a couple of events in the Valley, uh, started off with what uh, we termed the Rally in the Valley, an internship uh, conference on Wednesday, I believe, and then that was followed by a successful apprenticeship conference on Thursday and Friday. And so you had uh, a lot of folks in the Valley very uh, appreciative of the fact that we took the time uh, to, to hold those conferences in that particular uh, area region of our state and they were well attended and, and, and well appreciated and so congratulations on the work that you've done in, in that space to, to make truly make a difference all that's right. all the comments i have all right is there a motion to adjourn chairman i move that we adjourn second we move a second to adjourn we're adjourned thank you